Hello, welcome. We're just waiting for Johnny to join us in this conversation, these virtual master classes, these vintage port master classes. We must be getting in as soon as possible. Can you see me, Rich? Yeah, Johnny, I can see you well. Good evening. What time is it now? Are we, yeah, are we... it's fine. It's one yeah. minute past eight, so we're, oh, we're okay. on time. Great. Well, whoops. Well, welcome, welcome, everybody. Um, this is uh, the Churchill's Masterclass. <laughs> I'm going to be conducting this with my, um, my fellow winemaker and taster here, Ricardo. And um, we're, we are suitably socially distanced. I'm, I'm up here in my tasting room, and, and Rick is downstairs in the boardroom. So, um, but anyway, very, uh, very, very much, very welcome to you all. Um, we're going to be, we're going to be showing you tonight um, five different ports. Okay, we're going to be showing you uh, first of all our Churchill's Late Bottle Vintage. Uh, 2014 vintage. We're then going to show you two pairs of vintage ports. Um, a pair of Churchill's vintage ports, which is the 1994 and the 2014. So there's 20 years difference between the two. And then two vintage ports from Quinta de Grisha. Our single, it's a single Quinta vintage port, the 2005 and a cast sample of uh, the 2018 vintage, which we will, we shall be bottling uh, later this year. Okay. Um, before I actually talk about the late bottle vintage, let me just remind you a little bit about the philosophy behind um, the Churchill style of vintage ports. Um, at Churchill's, we believe we believe that you know in all our ports are. Uh, are produced from uh, grade A vineyards. These are what we. These are top, top uh, vintage port vineyards, and all our ports are only made from these vineyards. Okay, um, we since uh, since 1999, when we bought Quinta de Grisha, Quinta de Grisha has an influence in all the ports we produce these days, and particularly. Um, the fresher style. Quinta de Grisha is a, a vineyard, vineyard situated on the south bank of the River Douro um, in the Sima Corgo region. Uh, with the vineyards tend to have a, a more northerly aspect, and they produce a fresh style of port with excellent natural acidity. This is now very much a part of the contribution since we bought the Quinta in, in 1999. Quinta de Grisha now forms part of not only our vintage ports, our house vintage ports, Churchill's vintage ports, but also all our other ports, okay? Um, let me just tell you a little bit. We're going to be showing you two, two pairs of vintage ports. The first pair will be the house style vintage, which is the Churchill's vintage. Now, the Churchill's vintage is a blend. that blends of the top wines... Uh, from the top vineyards in a top year, okay? So they're the best wines that we produce from the best vineyards in, 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 in exceptional years, which we decide to declare as a Churchill's vintage. And the objective here is to create a powerful blend, which is going to last for many, many years. Where, you know, with a, with a, a classic house vintage, we expect it to last for 20, 30, 40, 50, even 100 years. The single Quinta vintage, on the other hand, uh, reflects the, the individual terroir and character of the vineyard. So the two uh, Quinta de Grisha vineyards, uh, vintage ports that we're going to show you are what we, we tend to call off-year vintages. So they're not a de they, they normally don't, they're not part of a declared year. But there are years when Quinta de Grisha, we feel, has made a particularly special wine that year. And it's especially suited to the climatic conditions of the year. And we prefer to show Quinta de Grisha on its own. 
Okay, Rick, any comments to add? Yeah, no, I, it's, I think Grisha has been a, a very important part of the blend we've been producing since we bought the Quinta. I think when you decided to buy the Quinta, you were looking for a, a fresher, purer style of, of ports. And I think Grisha, and especially in very hot years, I think Grisha behaves really well because, it's, as you said, it's not faced and that helps to, to prevent overripeness. And so I think at the end, it's very important in a vintage port to have uh, balance and you need freshness and natural acidity for that. So yeah. I think the exposition is important. Absolutely. And not only in vintage ports, but in all ports. Yeah. As I've said before, balance and elegance is fundamental as well as power and longevity, okay? Um, let's talk first about the first, let's pour the first port, sorry. And I know, I know you, you, those of you who, who have bought the EKs and have the ports in your, in front of you have, uh, I'm sure you followed the instructions because temperature is very important for serving port. And I asked you to try and keep uh, the temperature of the port uh, somewhere close to, to cellar temperature, which is uh, between 12 to 14 degrees uh, centigrade, which is 53 to 57 degrees Fahrenheit, roughly. Okay. Um, let's, this is our, uh, this is the 2014 Churchill's late bottle vintage. And this is, this is an unfiltered vintage. Okay. So this is what, in the old days, we used to call a traditional late bottle vintage. Um, and as a, as a result, it, it, it is a port that actually will go on uh, living in bottle and will continue to throw a natural sediment and will continue to age well. Okay, so the 2014 in, would, would have been bottled in our case in 2018. Late bottle vintages um, are called late bottle because they basically have to be bottled between the fourth and the sixth year, okay? With Churchill's, we like to bottle our, vint our late bottle vintages earlier. We bottle them in the fourth year. And, and we, this, this port will have been aged, um, it will have been aged all its life, not in barrel, it will have been aged in large uh, wooden uh, oak vats. Here, at, down here in our lodges, we have vats which uh, range from about 43 to 48,000 liters. So they're very big vats. The surface area um, of wood is limited to the quantity of wine. So, so it's more, it tends to soften the wine rather than having, uh, there isn't a great deal of, of, um, of wood influence that comes in during the four years. But we like to soften it a bit just to take the edges off it. But it's important, we like to try and emulate as much as possible a more mature vintage port. And that's why we only age it for four years um, in wood rather than six, okay? Because we don't want the wood to dominate the wine. Okay, Rick, I don't know if you have any added comments to make about the- Yeah, I think, I think the, the, the less the wine be, is in contact with oak, the, the more you soften the edges, as you said, but without giving it the, 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 the oak character. And I think it's important, that's the difference between rubies and tawny, is that when you, you, when you age the wines in big oak vats, you're micro-oxygenating a little bit the wines without giving it a, a, a bit of a wood character. And I think it still retains the fruits. And for us, I think it's very important to, to bottle it with, on the beginning, so at the fourth year, because you retain the freshness of fruit. And I think for, for an LBV, and especially the one we produce because it's unfiltered, I think it, it adds a bit of freshness and it also gives the, 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 the character and the potential to, to age. So I think it's, Absolutely. it's very important. And, and because it's softened, um, it actually is, it tastes, it's very pleasant to drink right away. I mean, it's, it's, a, it's a full body, but it's very pleasant to drink. I mean, this one, 2014 would have been bottled in 2018. So it's now in its second year. Is that right? That's correct. Yeah. Okay, so there is a little bit of sediment already being thrown. This is natural sediment, which is a combination of coloring matter and, and tartrates and potassium bitartrate, which is a, a natural element that, that, that is contained in ports. And it's what we always call the tannic, I call it the tannic girder, which helps to preserve in a vintage port, <laughs> um, preserve the longevity of a vintage port. You have uh, lovely fruit and, and, and that tannic 
that tannic element which helps to preserve it. Well, what tends to happen during the life of a vintage port, or in this case an LBV, it starts to precipitate, um, mixed with a certain amount of coloring matter and, and, and tartrates, they start to precipitate, okay? And that's um, really what, what matures it, okay? Yeah, the two extra years give it a bit of, makes it softer, but it's like a, a fast forward, so you can really enjoy the wine on an early stage without uh, removing the, the, the capacity to age. So I think the, the, the nice thing about being a, an unfiltered port is that you're not uh, removing the capacity to age in bottles. So I think it's, it's really nice to enjoy in an early stage, but you can still keep on, on laying the bottle down and it will yeah. keep on improving. The advantage of half bottles is that they age quicker. Yeah. So, um, you know, you, you have, let's say, okay, you might have the extra hassle because there's sediment, so you actually have to decant less wine. But the advantage is it actually matures more quickly. Yeah. Okay? Yeah, but it's, you know, it's, it's quite fresh, it's quite minty, quite, you know, there's lots of methyl and resin, so I think it's quite... It shows a little bit our style. There's, there's a freshness in this wine that I think hopefully people will agree that you can see throughout the flight. You know, there's a freshness, there's a nice natural there's, there's, that you feel at the bar. The freshness and there's what I call a plumminess, which you don't get in ports that have been filtered. Um, and you get that here, you get it with vintage ports and you get it with our LBV as well. There's a plumminess there. There's a, it's a, a combination of body and, and elegance here. Yeah, and the structure, because once again, uh, because we produce all our ports in, 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 in stone lagars and everything is food thread, I think you really feel the, 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 the structure of the wine. It's not a, yeah. it's not a light wine, you know. Yeah. You feel the structure and there's a, yeah. there's a real sense of, of, of complexity here, I think. Let me just, while we're talking about lagars, let me just say a couple of other things which I probably didn't say is that, uh, you know, we... There are two other factors that are important about Churchill's. We, um, as Ricardo says, we, we, all our ports are foot trodden in Lagares, and we, we believe in this system, we believe in this method. We feel that treading actually is a very um, efficient extraction method at a, with a more gentle, on a more gentle basis. It doesn't just, you don't damage you don't, or you don't have the risk of damaging the pips, which can often happen in more mechanical means. So we very much believe that foot treading is the best way to produce top quality ports. Um, the other two aspects is that we, we only use natural yeast. We don't use cultured yeast when we're making our ports. Natural yeast, yeast tend to, uh, they basically uh, produce a, a, a more naturally lower temperature, a naturally cooler te fermentation temperature, and therefore a longer, a longer fermentation period. And so you tend to get better aromas and better flavors uh, from natural yeast. The other factor is that we, just, we deliberately prolong the fermentation of our ports a little bit longer than, than, than is normal. We prefer to make our ports slightly drier than average, but as a result, we actually use less fortification spirit. We use less fortification brandy, and we, you, we rely more on the natural um, alcohol that is produced from, from the grapes themselves. And we believe this produces a better structure and a better balanced port, okay? Yeah, and, and the good thing about uh, using na native yeasts is that Normally we look for efficiency, but in this case they're a bit more sluggish, but they tend to ferment slower than, than the, the commercial is. And for us, as people know, port is all about, we have a small window of opportunity to extract color and flavors. And so because they, they, they ferment slower, it gives yeah, a bit more of extra time to extract gently what yeah. we want. So that's a good thing. Absolutely. Okay, we'll move on. By the way, please ask your questions. We will try and answer your questions a little bit later in the session, okay? Thank you. We'll move on now. We'll taste the... I'm going to taste these. What I suggest is we taste them together. We'll taste the 1994 Churchill's Vintage and the 2014 Churchill's Vintage, okay? Okay. 
So, so this is the 94. And the, and the 2014. I think 94 was a year of contrast. So I think it was a quite rainy and cold winter. And it was a quite hot and dry summer. Do you, do you remember that, Johnny? Yes, I think you're right. I mean, it, it ended up being, we always referred to 94 as being a hot year. Um, and when I mean a hot year is that it, it was, um, the wines were, were ripe. And, and um, on the, if anything, on the more mature side. I mean, obviously, we, we picked the grapes when the, you know, when at the right ripeness, but on the whole, it was what we call a mature year. And you can tell that because ever since right from the start, certainly our 94 uh, lost color quite quickly. Um, as you can see now, it's, it's actually got a lovely, uh, it, it almost looks like a 30 year old tawny to look at. It's got a lovely rusty color. But, um, but there's, the interesting thing is that it's 94 um, is a year which there is excellent structure. There was excellent structure. There is excellent structure for the white. You wouldn't less necessarily, if you look at this color, you'd think it's slightly light in color. But there's a complexity here. When you taste this port, there's a complexity that comes through in the 94. And it hasn't lost the texture. It's no. open up a little bit the color, but you feel it's quite, quite firm and quite steady still. It's quite, you know, there's, there's a line of freshness that I think it's quite, quite interesting. Even, even, quite though, even, though, even though these, this is before Grisha. Yeah. And so the, the, the vineyards that went into this were all what I call North Bank. So they were hotter, hotter vineyards, south facing, like yeah. Quinta da Gualta, for instance, south facing vineyard. And so therefore, you know, one of the interesting comparisons here is that, you know, whereas the 2014 has the Grisha element in it and has this very much the purple color and that freshness that comes with it. Um, and, 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 it's, and, and we start to get the berry, more of the berry flavor here. Yeah, but there's also a, a freshness, kind of a resinous touch on the, on yeah, the background. Yeah, exactly. There's more of a freshness and resinous touch, whereas this is more um, cherry, ripe cherries. Yeah. We, we have a question, Ricardo. What is the smell in the 94 vintage? Well, in my opinion, I feel a bit of, of, of black cherries, I think. The, the more you allow the wine to breathe in the glass, the more you'll feel the, the, the fresh element of the wine coming, coming, coming at you. I think I smell a bit of black cherries. There's also a bit of coffee beans and a bit of dark chocolate, in my opinion. But, you know, I think it's always subjective. What I like is that behind this, these notes of coffee and of, 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 of beans, you can feel the freshness and there's a bit of, there's a, not a bit, there's a lot of complexity on the behind. So yeah. I think... I'm very happy with the development of this one. It lost color, but it didn't lose the, 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 the intensity and the complexity. So I think, you know, for the, the time being, I think it's still a wine growing in terms of complexity. It hasn't reached its peak, in my opinion. Well, I, the way I call it is that I feel it, because it actually aged quite early, it's, re it's reached a sort of plateau, my feeling, is it, and it will now actually go on It'll last for quite a long time. I mean, this is already yeah. 20, what are we talking about? This is 26 years old, yeah. which is pretty much the, you know, the classic sort of age for a mature vintage port. But I think it's reached a plateau now and it'll keep aging. You know, it'll, it'll, it'll stay like this for a long time. Um, I think some, it needs to open up a bit. You know, this is, we've given it, I, I, <coughs> I, asked, you, I asked you to put it, I don't know if you were able to decant it, uh, obviously, it's always preferable to decant these ports for two reasons. Obviously, not only to, to take the sediment away, but also to allow the port time to breathe. And with these ports that have been locked in a bottle for over 20 years, or almost 30 years, they do need, you know, 
a good deal of time. You need to let them, let them open up a bit. And in fact, what the, the, the person who asked that question, maybe the best thing is just to leave it in the glass till the end of the tasting that we're doing and then come back and taste it again. Because I, I, I sort of feel that it's still opening up at the moment, okay? Yeah, it will keep on changing and bringing more, more elements to, to the taste. Absolutely. Okay, well, let's leave that one on the side there. And let's just taste the 14, which is, as we said, the 14 has got the Grisha factor, which is much more this freshness and this berry uh, factor to it. Um, now, 2014 was not a generally declared year. It was actually a, an atypical year. And uh, Ricardo reminded me probably better than I can remember, but it was... It was not a. It wasn't a particularly hot year, was it? It was an unsettled weather. Yeah, the weather was quite quite uh, difficult. It rained a lot throughout the year, uh, so it rained a lot. January, the spring was quite wet, and we had rain uh, in, during the harvest. So uh, for us, oh, that's right. There was rain in the harvest, and that yeah. was probably the big problem with the 2014 is that it rained, and. You're, and now, now it reminds me, we, we were fortunate, we were able to, we actually picked um, quite a number of our grapes, and, and not only our grapes, but the grapes that we, from properties that we were dealing with before, before the rain. Yeah, we started picking early, early September, early yeah. in the beginning, because, you know, it's one of those decisions you have to, 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 to take during a harvest, you're always aiming to pick the grapes at the best possible time, but sometimes you're, you bet to, to pick the grapes later or to pick the grapes earlier. And when, when you, you see the prediction that rain is coming, we, I remember that in 2014, we decided not to wait and we start picking as much as we could before we could. the rain. Yeah. And what we really felt were the top yeah. winners. Yeah. The top so we, we try to select the first, you know, the best grapes first. Yeah. And, and as a result, we decided um, to actually declare a vintage. I mean, so 2014 was a year which Churchill's really stuck their heads above the parapet. I think most of the other companies didn't declare a 14, and we did. And I, I think, looking back, I think the wine really proves that it's top vintage quality. Yeah. Because, you know, it's quite powerful but fresh and elegant once again. I think he has the, the dimension to age beautifully in the bottle. Yeah. I think you can feel a little bit here the, the element of Grisha in this wine. You feel the, 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 the line of acidity on this wine that I think Grisha really, really always gives to, to our blacks. And I think, you know, I think it's a wine that will really develop very, very well. Yeah. Really, I'm it's very happy with this wine. Okay, let's move on to the next pair, which is the single heaters. Um, I'll leave these in the glasses. Um, so, with, with, with the two single quintas, we have quinta, we have the two thousand and five quinta de Grisha, which is now uh, fifteen. What are we talking about, Ricardo? This is fifteen, 15 years. Yeah. 15 years old at the moment. Yeah, 13 years different, but it's 15 years old at the moment. So um, one of the factors we always feel with the difference between, in our, in, in our opinion, between a house vintage like Churchill's and a single Quinta is, as I say, the house vintage is made for power. We, we, we go, we select the qualities from the different vineyards and we, we blend them together uh, with the... Uh, the objective of making a compact, uh, elegant, compact, but powerful port that's going to age for many years. A single quinta is very much a, a port that, that will age according to its natural characteristics and its terroir. And so on the whole, it doesn't have the complexity of a blended house vintage, uh, but it has the purity of from coming from that location but it tends to mature quicker. And we always say that, you know, with the single quintas, you can start probably drinking single quintas 10 years after they've been, you know, they've been met, they're produced. Whereas with a Churchill's vintage port, you're really having to wait at least 20 years. Okay, so that's the difference. 
and and so this the two thousand and five. And I'm going to pour. Um, I'm at, of course where now. Uh, I'll also pour the the car sample of the the eighteen. Okay, the Grisha eighteen in the other glass. Okay, so let's just taste the two thousand and five first. Now, two thousand and five, Ricardo, I need your help here. Can you remember in terms of the? The, the weather, the yeah, weather. I think 2005 was quite hot. It was really a very hot and dry year. So I think yeah. it's one of those years where Grisha really performs because that's yeah. the, the benefits of being north facing, being a north facing vineyard is that in very hot years, I think grapes at Grisha they they mature slower. They don't they don't mature so fast, and so at the end you're able to retain the natural acidity and therefore the the. the the freshness and the balance that you're that you need in a wine that it's sweet and alcoholic. So at the end, I think natural acidity is really a key element for balancing ports, and uh, yeah. and I think Grisha really plays well with this this factor. Yeah, and actually the nose, and even in the color, the color's light. Okay, it's yeah. not that light, but it's still a, a you know there's a vinous color here. It's still quite a ready color. Okay, so it's still quite a fresh. There's, a, very much a freshness on the nose, which is which is very typical of Grisha. It's, it's a very appealing wine, this 2005, and I think it, it's drinking very well. Funny enough, it's one of the ports that my son Max was serving in, the, you know, in the porthouse when when he when he um, started the porthouse. This is one of the ports that he was serving at the time, and it it always was very popular. One of the things I like, I always enjoy in Grisha wines is that there's a sense of purity. You know, you, you really feel the fruit. Yeah. And I think that's really, really important. You feel that it's fruit-driven wine, especially. The, yeah. and, and in a very hot year like this, you really, you, you feel the balance. It's not, it's not over the top. You really feel the, the complexity of the, of the fruit. It's the fruit, isn't it? It's yeah. like, it's sort of what I, we always call blueberry. It's a sort of blueberry style of fruit. Because it's yeah. the fruit. And he also has uh, hints of floral and always has a, there's a, a, a green character. When I mean a green character, it's like a resinous, a minty, uh, hints of methyl. It always has a fresh aspect into this yeah. wine that really evolves, only evolves the wine. Yeah. Good. And we can now move on and taste the, 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 the new baby from <laughs> King to the Grish. The 2018, which I think is a is a classic example of what we're talking about. It's it's all to do with with as I said, the freshness of Quinta de Grisha, the the natural acidity, the, the the blueberry fruit quality really comes through here. And you also have that slightly stony, more um, uh, mineral side uh, that comes through as well. Yeah. No, you normally you see that on, on wines from Grisha that they're quite tense. It's it's a it's a, a word we always use on the tasting room. They, they have they have tension. I think tension is a bit of this this combination of tannic structure with natural acidity. It tends to, to, to make the wine we call it nervous, but in a good way because you feel there's kind of electricity. It's quite 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 vibrant. And I think in new wines and you know nowadays people tend to enjoy vintage ports when they're quite young. It shows everything. It's a wine full of everything. It's full of intensity, full of fruit, full of freshness. So I think it's quite quite vibrant and appealing to, to, to drink. And it's, it's vibrant, isn't it? It's not heavy. No. It's not, it's not a dead, it's not a heavy dead weight. You know, this is, it doesn't have to be heavy and dead necessarily or that to, to, to really, to, to last. I mean, what you're looking for is vibrancy and natural acidity. And that's what I really feel this port has. Um, and, 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 you know, this is a port that will, I think it's going to be, it's very elegant. It's going to be elegant. You'll be able to start drinking it, you know, quite young, but it'll ca carry on aging very well as well. Yeah, it's funny. When I start working in the port business and when I talked about elegant, people would say that elegant normal is not a word 
that you want to use with vintage port. But I think this is exactly what it is. Because for me, elegance it means balance. Yeah. And you can feel the power and the maturity, but you can also feel the, the natural acidity and the freshness. And for me, that's balance and that's elegance. So I think it's really nice to see and to compare two wines with a, with a different age. And you can see the starting point with 2018. And then you can see that it keeps on evolving in a, in a very elegant way and still quite fresh and appealing with the 2005. So I think, looking back, I think Grisha was really a good, a good bet for us because it really brings this fresh element into our, into our plants also. Yeah, absolutely. Good. Um, a question for, for Johnny. Is this cask sample the final blend? This cask sample is the final blend. Um, it's the final blend. Uh, it, when I say the final blend, it's not as if we made a huge amount of different blends. This is, this is the, the blend. Um, and, um, and the wine at the moment is actually in a stainless steel tank. And we're going to be bottling. When, when are we aiming to bottle this, Rick? Can you remember? I think we're going to bottle it maybe middle of June. Okay. I think that's when Before it gets too hot. Yeah. yeah. Okay, we have a couple of other questions. Uh, question for Ricardo. What are you going to do about food treading in light of COVID? Well, COVID has been, uh, has been a challenge for all of us. I think we will have all the safety measures we can. So we're going to prevent uh, people from being together. And, and hopefully we're going to find a solution for food treading. You know, uh, at the end... We're going to have to, to be able to, to ferment the wines in the style we want with all the precautions we need to have. So um, it's for us, for churches, it's really important to keep on food treading the wines because it's, it's all about our style. It's the way we gently extract. So we're going to prevent as much as we can to use machines. So we're going to have to be creative and find solutions. Eventually, we're going to have to split in two shifts to have less people inside of the Lagar to be able to extract uh, the way we want. So it's, but it is, it is a good question, and at the end, it's a, it's going to be a challenge, especially for a company for like us that we, we, because we're small and boutique, everything is done by hand or by foot, so uh, we will need to be creative for sure. Okay, a uh, question for uh, from Phil to Johnny: Are most of your quintas mixed grapes or varietal? And how do the blends of the 2014 LBV versus the 14 vintage differ in terms of blend? Right. Well, most of our most of our own quintas are a mixture. We have old vineyards that were what we call field blends, and the field blends are are, are vineyards that have a mixture of maybe up to 15 different varieties in them. We still, we still have that at Quinta de Grisha. Our old, our old vineyards, which are now uh, almost 100 years old. What, what are we talking, Rick? Yeah, they're, they're, they're around that. We know that for sure they're more than eight years old. Yeah. They are a, a mishmash. They're a mixture of all sorts of different varieties. Um, and then we have a period in our vineyards when we, there was a, this is before we were involved when there was mono planting. So we have Tsalyoinj, which have uh, Tinta Brauris, Tsalyoinj with uh, Tinta Baraka, uh, Tariga, uh, Franca, a little bit of Tariga Nacional. And then since we bought the property, we planted, because we felt there wasn't enough Tariga Nacional in the old villas, we planted a considerable amount of Tariga Nacional in the new plantings as well as Tariga Franca. Um, and, that's and a bit of Fosam, yeah. And, and sorry, and, and Tinta Roriz. Okay. Is that but right? That's, that's yeah. normal in the old vineyards to find um, uh, what we call the field blend. So it's always a combination. The old, the old, the old farmers, they would combine, um, we call it a mishmash, a combination of many grape varieties into the same, into the same plot. And it would be their way to ensure that... Uh, that there was a stability in terms of behavior and performance of the vineyard year after year. And so, like yeah. yeah. And so in Grisha we also have that. Not just in Grisha, but also with the with the with the with the properties we, we control. We also have that. We have the combination of many grape varieties in the same plot. And then there was a, a time, I think it started in the early eighties. 
that a combination of five grape varieties would be blended into the same vineyard. And now we are also planting single plots of single grape varieties. Okay. Yeah. And how do the blends of the LBV differ from the vintage? Well, let, let me answer that question a different way. And that's something I didn't probably explain. As I said, all, our, all the grapes that come into Quinta de Grisha to our winery are grade A grapes, okay, from grade A vineyards. We don't differentiate at that stage. We try and make vintage port. We try and, let's say, make the best out of all the grapes that we receive. So we try and, and produce um, vintage port from all the grapes that we actually make. And so they all get what I call vintage port treatment. Okay, even what happens after, you know, even the reserve. What happens then is that we then select, Ricardo and I, after the vintage, we then have a blind tasting, or we'd have at least one blind tasting, but maybe two or three blind tastings, where we classify our ports into a very simple system. We have at the top what we feel are a vintage quality, what we feel are LBV quality, and what we feel are reserve quality. But when those grapes are being vinified, or when they were received, as I say, they all get vintage port treatment. So if we classify some of that, those grapes as, as reserve, they will have received vintage port treatment for when they were being made, okay? So that's the way we do it. It's, it's purely on a tasting and selection basis. There's no preconceived idea about how we're going to make LBV or how we're going to make 10-year-old tawny or how we're going to make 30-year-old tawny. We try and make the best, right? We try and make the best vintage port to start with. Our feeling is that we need to, you know, uh, get the most out of the grapes. We want, to, we want to really get the best out of the grapes. And once we've done that, we can then decide, you know, as I think I've said to you in, in other um, tastings, you know, how... Our, our old tawnies have to come from our vintage level wines. So for a port to age for 30, 20, 30 years in cast, it needs to be a top level vintage port to be able to do that. So but the tree, we have this simple tree, which is vintage LBV and reserve. And that is our starting lineup. But there is no preconception really about deciding, well, we're going to choose these grapes for LBV and we're going to choose these for vintage. We have... Historically, we, have a, we obviously have a track record that we know that some of the vineyards that we make end up being <coughs> a vintage port. And, you know, but on the whole, there is no preconceived formula for making it. Yeah, Rick, we believe, add anything to that. Yeah, we believe that the Lagars are still the best way and to the, the food truck, uh, it's still the best way to, to, to produce vintage port. So at the end, we try to produce our wines this way. And it's, as Johnny said, it's really a question of selection. And we're at the end, because every given year, you have vineyards that will behave one way or the other. But, you know, we have a track record of, of, of there are vineyards that we know that consistently they will behave better year after year. But at the end, we believe in the process. And for us, it's still, it's very difficult, but it's still the best way to gently produce vintage parts. It's to, to use stone lagars and to have people to tread by it by foot. So it's really the LBV, it's produced this way, and the reserve is also produced this way. So at the end, it's a question of, of pure selection. We have another question. How long should you leave a vintage to drink? How do you know when it is the optimum time to drink? And can we leave it for 50, 60 years, Ricardo? I think Johnny has been fortunate to drink more older vintage ports than me, but I, in my opinion, I think Johnny will, will, will you get, add something to it, that. You get different, it's really what you want to get out of it. You, it's, I've said this, I'm not against people drinking vintage port young. Personally, I, I get more pleasure of drinking a, an older, a more aged vintage port. Why? Because what we're, what we're, when we produce a vintage port blend, as I said before, what we're doing is we're going and, and selecting uh, various different styles from different vineyards, okay? Uh, you might have the aromatics from one, the power from another, the acidity from another. You combine this and it makes a compact unit, okay? And 
it's what I think is lovely is when there's a period of time when that remains compact. You know, when you produce a vintage port, uh, a young vintage port, it will stay uh, as, as a Venice unit until it starts to what we call open up. And you can drink it, there's, you know, because as I said before, I believe that a, even a young vintage port should be well balanced and elegant. So there should be that element of quality to even a powerful vintage, young vintage port. So it should always be possible to vintage, to drink it, and it's your preference whether you like to do that or not. My own preference is that I love to see what I call that kaleidoscope of colors and flavors and aromas that start to open up when a vintage port starts to mature because you get those individual qualities beginning to appear. And that to me is what's, what is fabulous. And obviously also the freshness as well. And so that's why if I had the choice, I would prefer to age my vintage ports uh, for as long as possible, okay? In terms of the question, the questioner asked whether, you know, what's the timing? It differs, it, to be honest. There's usually, what tends to happen is that when you produce a young vintage port, it'll be very fruity and, and very uh, easy to see the unit, the compact unit will be fruity for the first probably three to five years. It then closes up. Once it's been bottled, after a couple of years of bottle, it starts to close up. And you get the, that tannic element, which is gonna preserve the, the fruit for the long term starts to close down the port. And there's a period of time with, with a vintage port between probably five to 15 years, when, or five to 10 years, anyhow, when it's what we call closed. So it's, it's, it's really not showing very much. You can still drink it, as I said before, you can always drink it. It's, it's, a, it's elegant, it, it's, but it's just not showing a great deal. Then it starts to open up and starts to begin to open up. And the, the bigger the vintage, the better the vintage, the longer that period takes. So it could, any, it could take anywhere between 15 years to 100 years. And, I mean, you know, and, and I've, I've had the fortune to be able to, I've actually drunk, in my time, I've, I've had a, a port that was 100 years old and it was drinking beautifully. It was fabulous. And it very much depends on the, on the quality, the potential of the year and the vintage. Okay. Uh, following that question, uh, we have another from Roger. Have you changed the style of your vintage port over the years to uh, be more approachable younger? No, not really, not really, no. No, no, that's not true, we haven't, no. Uh, the only change from Churchill's point of view is, is, if anything, the other way. We've actually, we've introduced Keen to the Grisha into our vintage blend now. And, and Keen to the Grisha gives us this freshness and, and if anything, a more more acidity and more tannin, which is actually going to is going to actually um, preserve preserve it for the long term. Okay. Yeah, and it adds the purity of fruit. I think Grisha is quite As the well. sour wine that Grisha produces is quite pure and focused. That's I think the big change on Churchill's blends throughout the years. But in terms of style, we always believed in in the, in the lagars and in long macerations in uh, in uh, in native yeast, so I, th I think that we haven't changed. Is we have... Sorry. Sorry, a question from Claire. How does Tony fit into the vintage LBV and reserve tree? How does the what? The Tony's fit into the L vintage LBV and reserve tree. What was the last word you said? The tree, um, I think I, I, I know what the question is. Okay. It's, it's, it's once again the selection thing. When we're, when... The, the, the tree yeah. is the way is the way that Ricardo and I classify the ports. So we have a three-tier system. We class. It's very simple. We're a small company. We classify three levels: vintage, uh, LBV, and reserve. Okay. Now, what that means is that for old tawnies, for the older tawnies, it comes out of the top level because we need to have a more powerful, a stronger wine that's going to withstand the aging in barrel, in cask for 20, 30, 40 years. <coughs> with, the, with our Churchill's 10-year-old, we tend to choose from the LBV level because we only have to age it for 10 years. 
With the reserve, we don't actually yet produce, we haven't yet produced a young tawny. If we were to produce a young tawny, let's say a five-year-old tawny, it would come out of the reserve start of the reserve port, okay? Yeah, we, ba we base our selection in aging potential uh, because we need, a wine needs to have aging potential because if the, the, the aging in bottle is, it's, it's okay, the aging in cask, it's even more aggressive. So at the end, you need a wine to be powerful enough and to have the proper structure and capacity to age to overcome the, 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 the aging in cask. So that's why we select the 30 and the 20 and the 30 and eventually a four-year-old Tony from a vintage quality wine. So it means that we need that aging potential and capacity to hold on to, to its characteristics being inside of the cask that is quite more aggressive in terms of, of aging process. Can, can you sum up, Ricardo, what are the differences in winemaking after you decide the branch classification? Any different fortification, aging vessel? No, we tend to age the wines exactly the same way. The diff we ferment them all the same way. The difference is that when we select a wine for a vintage blend or for an LVV blend, it means that the LVV blend will stay for two extra years in the big oak vats. But, so that means that we're going to add two extra years of aging to the wine to make it a bit more rounder and softer and to make it approachable uh, a bit earlier than a vintage port. In terms of the reserve, reserve, it's always a combination of wines with an average age of three to four years. So it means that we're going to blend it. It's, while the LBV and the vintage, they have the, the, the year on the bottling. So you, you have an LBV 2014, you know it's been bottled in 2018. If you have a vintage 2018, you know it's going to be bottled in 2020. And with the reserve port, it's always an average age of wines with about three to four years. So it means that we're going to blend it with, with other wines to produce a blend that at the end retains the, 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 the main characteristics of, of the wine we want to produce. Freshness, purity and intensity. Okay, So that's the different uh, styles. Yeah. Uh uh, Johnny, a question from Roger. Can you see a financially sustainable market for a 30-year-old white port? Uh, yes, probably. Um, it's always easy to say that after the event, isn't it? I mean, um, but yes, the answer is yes. I think there's probably... Um, I don't Well, sustainable. The difficulty is sustainable is... It means that you obviously have to start aging white port on that basis because so one thing is one thing is is being able to maybe go out and buy uh, a thirty year old or an old white port, but those are few and far between these days. There was a time when uh, dairy farmers would have quite a lot of these ports in their cellars, and it was possible to buy these ports, but these days that isn't the case and so you're looking actually at, at making them, at producing them and aging them for 30 years. You know, it's, it's, it's possible. I, I'm, I'm, I have nothing, I, I'm, I'm, I'm a fan um, of old white ports. I like, I think the older they get, you know, we tend to make, we produce a dry white port as an aperitif, which is 10 years old. Um, I think the older white ports should be more delicate and therefore probably a little bit sweeter. Um, I don't know whether it would be good to produce an old or drier white port. I don't know, Rick, have you got any thoughts about that? Yeah, I think, you know, uh, the more you age the wine, the more you need to, to, to keep the balance. And I agree with you that probably a very old white port with a bit more of, of the oak influence could be uh, better with a bit more of, of sweetness. To be able to, to combine and to make it elegant in that in, in that way. So I think you know sustainability is always difficult to 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 to, to say on an early stage. I think port is always a marathon, and especially when when you talk about aging ports and aging tonies, you're always aiming to see ahead. It's not something you produce for the immediate return. So it's always difficult. We believe that it's. Uh, that it's good to age and that it will have return. Otherwise, we wouldn't be producing tonnies and, and yeah. ports. A question from Eric. Uh, Ricardo, how many bottles of the vintage 2018 are we producing and are they released to the market in the fall or will we wait to release them? 
uh, when we're producing a Grisha Vintage Port, it's always a very tiny amount. It's it's an old, a very old vineyard. It doesn't produce that much, and we, the vineyard doesn't grow. So we're always aiming between 2,000 and 5,000 bottles. It's never, uh, it, it always depends on the year. I think in this particular case, we will be aiming about 3,000 bottles. So it's it's a very tiny, a tiny selection. Uh, and we will, I think we will be releasing it uh, soon. Uh, Johnny, a question from Big Forty Five Tasting: If you could have the weather to make any vintage port, you could. Which vintage would you choose? Twenty-seven, forty-five, seventy. If I had the weather. The weather. <laughs> that's, that's a difficult question. <laughs> Let me just answer first of all. I, I'd love to have a twenty-seven again or a forty-five or even a 63. Um, um, quite often, these vintages, it's interesting because the question I often get asked is, what is the ideal climatic conditions for producing a great vintage port? Which is always a difficult question to answer because quite often, I've seen often that you know, that doesn't follow the rule. You sometimes can have a, an ex a great vintage from a very unusual year. So it doesn't necessarily follow that, you know, normally we say you've got to have good rainfall in the winter, cold, good rainfall in the winter, um, you know, a warm spring with good flowering in May, good flowering conditions in May, and a gradual build-up of heat um, during the summer with extreme heat in, in August, uh, preferably a touch of rain at the end of August just to finally mature the the grapes, and then have no no rain during the vintage. That is that is the ideal weather conditions. Now, um, well, you know, sometimes that I mean that doesn't necessarily mean that it's going to be a great vintage. That's all. And 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 I mean I have an example. You know, to, Ricardo, two thousand and seventeen. Yeah, was a classic example, which is a very dry year. We 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 actually started picking. In August, August. Or, or, yeah. So it's and, it's one of those years you wouldn't expect the wines to be so balanced and fresh, and they are. Yes. And, you know. And what's amazing about the seventeen is the freshness. As we yeah. said. Even though it was a really hot year, it's, there's a, a terrific amount of freshness in the seventeen. Yeah. Now let's not forget 2011. It was also an amazing year. Yeah. I think it's one of the years that we will keep on on tasting. That I think it's one of the best years. Yeah. I hope. We we have a last question. I would ask you both. Uh, what is your what would be your choice of port for a desert island? <laughs> <laughs> desert islands nowadays are very fashionable because everyone needs social distancing. I would go for an old vintage. If I'm able to choose a wine, I choose one I like most. So I, I will go for an old vintage for sure. Yeah, definitely. I'd go for an old vintage. I, I would drink, um, personally, I would probably drink uh, Churchill's 1985. Um, if I could lay my hands on some really old vintages um, before, you know, I'd go for, a, I've, I've often said this, I'd happily get, go for a Copeland's 1947, which is one of my favorite old vintages, pre-Churchill's. But um, no, Churchill's 85 would be great. That would suit me. Um, and hopefully it'd keep me alive long enough to actually be saved by whoever. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know, I would go for it. Sorry, just before we finish, maybe the person who asked the question, we should just, if you've kept that uh, 94 in your glass, just now have a smell, just nose that glass, because it will have opened up that much more. And it's just beginning, I think it's now beginning to show what we were talking about, which is more of this cherry aroma. And there's a laugh on the palate. It's, and it's quite long. A bit of that, it's lost a bit of that slightly reductive. It had a little bit, because it's been locked up in a bottle, you, you'll start always to get a bit of reduction, which you have to blow off. And it takes time to, for that to disappear. And it, I think it's disappeared now. But I think the complexity and the length and the, the, and the intensity is still quite quite interesting. It's, it's a beautiful it, wine to drink. It, it it's quite enjoyable. Yeah. Yeah. Good. Well, 
Thank you very much, everybody. I hope you've enjoyed um, Thank you. this last class. We're, we're going to be back um, actually on Thursday. We'll be we'll be doing this in, in Portuguese. So if any of you um, would like to join us, you're very welcome. Anyway, thank you very much. Cheers.